Well, this is it. The time is upon us. This is the run-up week, the week before we begin the season for the 2019 Bassmaster Elite Series. I'm Tommy Sanders here in the studio with Mark Zona. It'll be a good opportunity for us right now to look at the eight regular season events, plus one event in Texas that carries a little extra weight. Nine total. Here's where we're going across the country. Let's start it out in the state of Florida. And at once every three years on average, we will start the season down here in Palatka, Florida on the St. John's River. And from the St. John's River, going to a place that the leads, believe it or not, have never been before, Lake Lanier, Gwinnett, Georgia, not too far from the Atlanta area. Right after Lanier, we're going to head up to the Bassmaster Classic in Knoxville, Tennessee, on the Tennessee River. From there, going back to a place where we had the Bassmaster Classic last year at Lake Hartwell. We're going to lay over in South Carolina for another stop at Winya Bay. Different sort of environment right there. And of course, that Texas event, the Toyota Texas Bass Fest, is going to come to you from Lake Fork in this Texas. This is interesting. Stop number six, Gibson in Oklahoma, a place that we've been on the Elite Series. From there, turning around to a big bass factory in Lake Gunnersville. Absolutely. And then we're going to head up north all the way to Waddington, New York, and the St. Lawrence River, a very popular destination. And another stop there that's popular as well in the Finger Lake. Lakes, Cayuga Lake, and Union Springs, New York. But let's start it from the start here. Let's, let's break it down. We're going to start in Palatka, Florida. The longest river in the state of Florida is the St. John's River, 310 miles. It flows from south to north. It's a lazy river until you get into the tidal areas, but it's a legendary river for bass. No doubt about it. Really, if you looked at a lot of the tournaments that we had on the St. John's River in the past, this is the land of giants. There's always the potential of a 30 pound stringer, whether it's been Chris Lane in the past. The last time we were there, Rick Clun, but really every time we go to St. John's, it comes down to really the weather that's building into the event. Will these guys be looking at them spawning or will they be casting them? But one thing I'll tell you, Tommy, this time around, not as much grass Will that change the complexion of how they catch them? Long-time Elite Series fans, no particular places there. Lake George probably the most popular. It's vast, it's huge, and it attracts a lot of anglers. No doubt about it. I mean, Lake George is probably the most stable to catch a limit every time. Every time we have a tournament on the St. John's River, it seems like half of the field lives in Lake George for the simple fact that all that eel grass in there and hard bottom, hard bottom, and the springs in Lake Georgia are what created really the biggest stringers that we've seen come out of there. But every tournament we have here, every tournament we have here, we always look at Cliff Grins, where you're like, he's gonna do it. He's gonna do it. And he's had a stumble at least one day every time we've been here. I'm Hell looking yeah. for that guy to turn it around this time. All right, one more question to you in 2014. I think the winning weight was 90 pounds. We mentioned that one uh, well, when uh, Rick Clun decided to paint one more masterpiece. Maybe he's got plenty more masterpieces coming. The weight was 81 pounds. Which of those will be closer to what the reality will be in 2019? Right in between. Right in between. Give me 85 pounds. All right, St. John's River, we are off and running this 2019 season. Before we get to the next stop, we want to explain that we have an extra special guest in the studio to help us with our preview of Lake Lanier. And we did not warn Bob Cobb, the great Bob Cobb, who was there at the birth of BASS. He is inseparable from the success of BASS. Master of all media for BASS. We didn't warn you, Bob, that we would talk about Lake Lanier, but let me start by asking you, how did you guys, back in the day, in the early years, how did you plot a season? How did you decide which lakes you'd go to? We were blessed. The Army Corps of Engineers at that time was damning everything that was running. <laughs> and bass lakes were popping up all over the South. Bass tournaments do have an influence not only on the community, bringing in in dollars, bringing publicity to it, but when there's an environmental situation there, that's the soldiers on the front line. Great, great, yeah, yeah. And Lake Lanier that we're about to talk about right now has been in the mix since at least 1983, was a little late to the party, but you can understand why that would be a pick because it was good fishing. It's a big time spotted bass fishing lake. That's what most people know. Well, that's that's the secret to it. And if if you've got some, some elite pros, they're, they're gonna be thinking about fishing uh, Lanier this season. I'll give you one tip. Get Tom Mann Jr.'s phone number <laughs> and ask him to give you the inside tips. Tom Mann knows more about that than Mickey Bruce, two, two guys that made their reputation on, on Lanier that I could stand here and pretend to tell you about. You, you hit the key word though, it's a spotted bass lake and uh, you anticipate spots deeper water and uh, it's a recreational lake too so you may, you may have an opportunity to dodge and duck water skiers too. So, if that happens, you move back into the creeks. But that's one of the one of the challenges of fishing Lanier, I think, and 
anybody that's, that's entering the tournament, they're going to have to do the homework. Yeah. Before we wrap it up, one more question. We're going to do this in the winter. This will be in the late part of February. I would think for spotted bass fishing, it might be a little bit easier to catch that time of year than when the water separates temperature. I think water. I think probably that if if the depending on the conditions, water temperatures, where the shad schools are, and those things, uh, the spots could gang up. You could catch uh, a boatload at, at a certain spot, and you could see uh, activity depending on the the, uh, the weather. But uh, it could be a, it could be miserable there oh, <laughs> in February. <laughs> Anytime we do yeah, a tournament, it, it could, you know a tournament. I bet you could tell some stories about some tournaments that turn out that way, Bob. We're out of time. We've got to move on to the next lake. What a pleasure! What a treat to have you on set with us. Thanks for all that good insight on Lake Lanier and the whole process itself. Good luck, guys, on Lanier. All right. They're always biting somewhere. <laughs> Another important thing, Bob would agree with this: is the Geico Bassmaster Classic, and that is what we're looking at next. Z, I know you're excited about the classic. For the third time in history, we return to the great state of Tennessee, but for the first time in over a decade, everything is all in one location. The takeoff, the arena is literally on the bank of the river. You're, you're gonna be able to attend this classic, and I'm making a prediction right now, most attended classic ever. When you think about it all under one umbrella, it has to break records. Well, there's no doubt. I mean, you know, Knoxville, Tennessee is one of the hubs of bass fishing throughout the entire country. But this is gonna be a different monster this time around. The reason I say that is, so many of the places that we go for the classic, whether it's Lake Hartwell, it's Grand Lake, we've been there multiple times. The anglers that fish those tournaments, they've had multiple looks that time of year. This time around, going to the Tennessee River, Fort Loudoun, Teleco, it's almost like it's an unknown. And here's the other side of it. Usually there's a heavy, heavy favorite that really knows that body of water. Not as much. If you talk to a lot of guys that live within 100 miles of Knoxville, they'll tell you, I don't fish there a lot. I really don't know. But that being said, Dave, if you look at this body of water, massive, 70 to 90 miles long, the difference here is there's really no grass. This will be a kind of a hard cover tournament or fishing flats off the main river. Here's the one thing I'll tell you though. This time of year, whenever you get into March, approaching April, two things. The fish want to be up in the dirt and the other side is they're as big as they get all year long. What techniques are going to dominate this event? Oh, if you play fantasy fishing on Bassmaster.com, you better pick somebody with a flipping stick or say somebody with a square bill crankbait. You'll do okay. If I know a lot of the locals are playing it down, like they don't have experience. If you had to pick a local, who's the one? Uh, man, you st you gotta throw it to guys that you know. I, I call them kids, kids that have grown up on these rivers. You look at your Brandon Lester's, guys that just know the really the surrounding bodies of water. And really, if you go off of history, those guys just do good in the state of Tennessee. <laughs> Well, they're going to have a lot against them. Obviously, the pressure, we've seen it year after year, that local favorite, it is so hard to overcome that. And this is going to be an absolute party because everybody, once again, is under one umbrella in the great city of Knoxville. Oh boy, looking forward to it. Hard to believe, Davey Height, that this is only the third time ever in the state of Tennessee for the Bassmaster Classic, but that is the truth. So let's, let's talk about the third stop of the year right now, a place where we have enjoyed Bassmaster Classics in 08, in 14, and last year, 2018, in your home state, the Palmetto State Lake Hartwell. Well, Lake Hartwell is a great fishery, no doubt, but we've been there early in the year for those classics. It being the first of April, there'll be a lot of things going on. And you know, last year at the Classic, we saw some people fishing shallow, we saw some people fishing offshore, around the boat docks. We'll see the most diverse tournament we've ever had on Lake Hartwell here in April. We saw some famous futility, especially Jason Christie at that last one. He was trying to sort of, everyone was chasing the change that was happening temperature wise throughout the week and, and he was trying to stay ahead of it. Couldn't quite make it last through that final day. Are things going to be a little more stable this time around? You're exactly right, Tommy. It should be a little more stable because it's a little later in the year, but I think it'll still be very important to pay attention to the weather, how cold the nights get. If we have warm nights or cold nights, if you are locked in on a sight fishing pattern, if you have cold nights, it could back those bigger female fish off. And, and it not hold up, just have those smaller fish. The key to winning this term is gonna be consistency. And I also think it'll take someone 
just like with the classic last time we were there that has a mixed bag going on a couple different patterns capitalize on what's happening each and every day of those four days of the event the fact that this is a blueback herring lake is that is that going to give extra special trouble to some of these guys who are new to hartwell more so than we've seen in those classics the blueback herring could very well be spawning doing their thing some schooling activity up shallow which we've not seen in those classics remember casey ashley we saw him basically Focusing on the blueback herring, but very deep with the underspin type bait, we'll see some blueback herring action. I totally believe this, probably three to five feet or even less. Too early to predict the winner? <laughs> uh, too early the winner. I, I just like, I think it's real important for a person to be versatile during these four days because there'll be several things going on. You get a warm night and calm winds. Sight fishing will be the key. You get some wind and some, some weather stirring around, stirring around those blueback herring, you better be on top of those. As we transition over from Lake Harwell, a popular destination on the Bassmaster Elite Series, we're going to stay in the state of South Carolina, but go over to the Low Country, over to Winyah Bay, another familiar fishery, Davy Height, and, and Winyah Bay is going to be an interesting twist in the middle of the season. It's an interesting twist, but I really like this event. You know, it's the Bassmaster Elite Series. We're all over the country, diverse fisheries, rivers, man-made lakes, uh, the St. Lawrence, you know, that huge river system up there, smallmouth bass fishing. And, and this, this fishery is influenced by the tide, but it's such a vast fishery. There's a lot of options. Do you stay close and play it safe and catch some, some fish? They're typically not gonna be as big as some of the ones where you run up the rivers, but anytime you make those long runs, you know there's a gamble. That's the gamble that a lot of guys took in 2016. We had the Elite Series event there. A lot of guys took that 100 plus mile route each way up to the Cooper River, and that is in play this year. The anglers voted to keep the Cooper River in place, so we'll have that have those long runs, that will be a factor. But, Davey, there are other there are other creeks and rivers that factor just as much. You got the Santee, which is not nearly as far of a run, and then you've got those rivers that are close, the Waccamaw and the Black River, right around Georgetown. It's much more stable than and, and keep all the chips in front of you than, than pushing them in the middle of the table. Well, the one thing I learned through my years of fishing the Bassmaster Tournament Trail, just because you run 100 miles or you run 50 or 60 miles does not mean when you get there those fish are going to jump in the boat. And, and I've learned it the hard way through the years. But to gamble and to go to the Cooper River, where the larger fish are known to be there because it's less influenced by that salt water and the, and the tide and that sort of thing. A lot of fresh water coming out of the back of Lake Moultrie. But, you know, it, it'll be interesting to cover this event. It, it was interesting when I was there in 2016 to fish the event. Uh, the first day I stayed close and, and caught a limit, was, was in the money, everything looked good, and I just couldn't help myself. I'm, I'm one of those guys that just try to, I think I need to try to win an event, and I, it bit me, that long run bit me. Did not make it back in the way in that day. Uh, so I'm living proof that making that gamble, the old saying, go for broke, most times you end up broke. Well, it's not just the equipment people are worried about. Their equipment normally performs flawlessly, but you got to get gas probably twice, or at least once going up, and then maybe some guys on the way back, depending on how fast you go, how, how quick the tide's going in and out, the speed you can carry, and then also your fishing time. It's going to be cut dramatically if you make that run. That's something you got to think about, making that run. If you make it safely and all your equipment works well, you still got that long run and you've got a limited time to fish. And there again, if you if you run a long way, if you've only got four hours to catch five bass, that seems easy, but it's not always that way with the pressure of fishing against the best in the world. So it just depends on what you want to do. It's just a lot of areas to go. The big PD, the little PD, you mentioned all the others. A lot of options there. It'll be interesting to see all the different decisions that are made by the elite fishermen. Do you stay close? Do you make a long run? Those are the factors at Winyah Bay, the fourth stop of the Bassmaster Elite Series. That'll basically be our halfway point before we transition to the second half of the season, and points are going to be valuable this time of the year. Bassmaster Toyota Texas Best returns to its original home, the crown jewel of all those amazing Texas lakes, Lake Fork. And that is basically the house that Keith Combs built. I mean, he became money combs fishing those events because he won three of them, one of them by 110 pounds. Can anybody beat this dude? Oh, you, hey, you're gonna definitely have your hands full. If you're gonna beat Keith Combs on Lake Fork, and here's the, I, I, I got to see front and center what this guy knows on that lake offshore, and it is staggering. The other side of it is, it, it, it's a little bit earlier than a lot of the TTBCs that you covered with Keith Combs, but the other side of that is, oh, yeah. Whenever you hit an offshore school that's not been tapped yet, where they've not been banged on for weeks and weeks and weeks, that's when you see your biggest Woo! stringers, and that's what's going to definitely make him probably the most powerful and hardest to beat in that tournament. With that being said, 
every time that, that you've covered those events at Lake Fork, there's always a little bit of shallow water stuff playing here and there. And it being in early May, you're still gonna see that. But, but here's the best way to put it, man. Keith Combs literally made the statement, I bought a house from these tournaments that, that I've won on Lake Fork. And with what I saw, literally with my own eyes, I, he might buy another one. <laughs> you fished with him the day after one of those wins. Uh, it was the it was the weekend after after he won one of those tournaments. He said, "Hey, look, you need to come down here. The 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 nine to eleven pounders are biting." And yeah. number one, <laughs> when did you hear somebody you? say that? Yeah, I was like, right <laughs> "Don't you ever threaten me with a good time." <laughs> uh, and I went down there and got to see the kind of stuff that he looks for. The, here's the other side of this. The other side of this is. It's not like one of your offshore tournaments that maybe we go to on, on Kentucky Lake where there's 30 or 40 offshore schools. You have fished there, Dave. It actually fishes very small offshore. Maybe there's a half dozen to 10 really key spots, but here's the thing. When you're watching Bassmaster Live, if you get on one of those five or six spot schools, oh my goodness, what happens? A million dollars is on the line at this event and a Bassmaster Classic berth. No pressure, Keith Combs, but we'll see you there. All right, guys, while everybody's recovering from Texas Fest, it'll be time to head up the road from the state of Texas to neighboring Oklahoma. Up there a little bit, we're going to go to Fort Gibson Lake. That's uh, on the Grand River system. Luke Palmer's with us, Oklahoma angler Luke Palmer from, from Colgate, Colgate, Oklahoma, a little bit down the road, but uh, he's spent his time on Fort Gibson here. Let's take a look at the map here, uh, Luke, real quick, and take a look at what how Fort Gibson lays out. Not very big for a full field. It's less than 20,000 acres, so that's something you have to contend with from the very start, right? Yeah, you're gonna have you're gonna have pressure. I mean, you got it. You got it. Which I mean, you got a whole whole lake. I mean, you got so much different structure in the lake. I mean. Depending on what water level we're at, you know, we've been getting a bunch of rain. We could be 10 foot high. We sure. could be six or seven foot low, you know, depending on what they want to do with the lake. Well, absolutely. You, you know, originally we hadn't been there in almost a decade. This tournament back a decade ago was scheduled to be on the Arkansas River, but it was so flooded. We had to move it to Fort Gibson. And uh, let's talk about the time when that happened. When that tournament happened, it was late June. It was extremely hot. We'll be there about a month earlier. Was that going to make a difference? Is that going to be better fishing or, or, not, or, or not as good? I was actually at that tournament. It was bad the first one, but I wasn't fishing. I was watching. Yeah. Now I, it, it's going to make it better because you're going to have so many fish. There's going to be a lot of trans transition probably. I mean, you're still going to have your fish shallow because it always has a little population of fish shallow. But depending on what we have, we could have a major shad spawn going on into May too. You know, depending on we might have a few fish still spawning. Mm -hmm. But majority is probably going to start making their way out to. You know, it's got foundations, rock piles, and, you know, it's got a few ledges in it and stuff. I mean, you can start, you, you got, you can go plumb up the river, you can go up there and fish for oh, current yeah. coming out. You can go mean, under the bridge and yeah. keep going, yeah. You got, you got a lot of water to cover and a lot of fishable water and a lot of non-fishable water too. And, but Well, that complicates things for a place that is so pressured. You mentioned pressure earlier, so close to Tulsa. I mean, this is a small lake. What's your philosophy on fishing super pressured water? How do you make a difference? You got to find something a little bit different, don't you? You know, I normally kind of go, I go a little heavier on my baits, a little bigger sometimes. And you know, maybe people, a lot of times they want to drop back and finesse. Maybe I want to go up there, I want to magnum size the stuff and, and get above it to where they might not have seen that very often. That's what I kind of do on my on pressured waters, you know, especially on this one here even. All right, well this is an average, de this is one of the most shallow lakes we'll fish. Also an average depth, I believe this, 15 feet on Fort Gibson Lake. So if you're not a shallow water guy, you might want to rethink your, uh, your skill set, right? It, you can be, and, it, and if that thing's about five foot low, you better be watching for your lower unit too. All right, Luke Palmer. Good luck on Fort Gibson. Good luck all season long. Your first year on the Bassmaster Elite Series. And guys, we'll throw it back to you right now as we get ready to take a look at the mecca of bass fishing, Lake Gunnersville. We'll stop number seven on the Bassmaster Elite Series. Davey, you have to have a, a Fenway Park. A soldier's field, that is where we're going in June this time around for Lake Gunnersville, Alabama. And really, if you look at the Elite Series in the past, March, April, May, how will Gunnersville fish differently this time around? Well, you're right about the Fenway Park. Lake Gunnersville is one of the most famous lakes in the country, no doubt. We've had so many great tournaments there. I like it being there a little later. There's nothing wrong with going back to the same fisheries. You want to go to those great fisheries year in and year out, but changing the time of year makes it fish like a total different place. We'll have more vegetation, more grass there than we've had in the past. I think top water action will, will come into play, especially early morning. 
offshore cranking, although those fish have been out offshore for a long time. In years past, when we were there in June, about half of the field would be up shallow, catching some of those fish around the shallow vegetation, and the guys that were fishing out deep for those first fish moving out seemed to do good. But this tournament will be determined on some guys finding those places later in the year that are being fished offshore and then going shallow. Some of the biggest names in the sport have won here on Gunnersville. If you look at Kevin Van Dam's dominant performance offshore to another guy, Skeet Reese, and I'm not going to lie, this whole studio was ready to give one man the title of that Elite Series victory. It was a one Davy height. Walk us through that event and really kind of what happened because the wheels were on the bus till that final day. Well, I, I took pride in, in being able to hold on to leads, leads in my tournament career, but that one event, I had the lead going into the final day, and, and it's just plain and simple. At Gunnersville, you have to catch them every single day. I had a 23, a 25, and I think a 27 pound bag leading in that last day. I had beat those fish up. I only had two really good quality offshore places. I beat them up too much. I knew I was in trouble if those fish moved off that one key spot. And they did. To add salt to the wound, Skeet Reese had to throw a mop jig and, and come back and catch like 25 pounds on the last day. Unbelievable event. You had to be consistent with big weights. Another place you're going to have to do that. Well, Tommy, Dave, I think you know where we're headed next. Dave, for the last two months, we've had the new anglers, a lot of new anglers for the Elite Series 2019. Coming through the studio, I asked them one stupid question every time. I didn't think it was a stupid question, but it is stupid because they give the same answer every time. I say, where are you looking forward to going the most? During the course of the season, every 100% say the St. Lawrence River, Waddington, New York. Waddington is everything that the Bassmaster Elite Series is. Big fish, big show. I mean, it really, that's what it is. And, you know, the, the, the anglers that haven't experienced it before, they've seen the pictures, they've seen the crowds and the fishing. I mean, it is absolutely unbelievable. And you got to remember, for the first time since, what, the inaugural season of the Bassmaster Elite Series, we have some Canadians on the Elite Series. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're yeah. right on the border. Three. Three Canadians on the Bassmaster Elite Series. Of course, the Johnson brothers, Chris and Corey Johnson, both have won major tournaments on that body of water. And Gussie, you know, he's he's not really a local, to be honest. His house is about 22 hours north of, <laughs> of Waddington, New York. But you're going to see those. I'm, I'll tell you, I'm putting pressure on him right now. I think... Two out of the three will make the top 12, maybe three out of the three. Well, just about half of everybody does fabulous there. I mean, I mean, catching 25 pounds and then catch 20 pounds, you don't even make the cut. Unbelievable, that body water. And year after year, we find out just when we think it can't get any better, it gets better and better. And the time of year we're going here now, I would expect if everything's normal, we'll have a lot more drop shotting, a lot more deeper fish. You know, we've been there when they've been shallow. We've been there when they've been deep. I think you'll see a lot more fish set up and maybe even some bigger weights. Yeah, it was a drop shot deal last time um, for, for the most part, but we've seen the spy bait play there, the marabou jig, you know, crank baiting, of course, down closer to Lake Ontario, but could be anything at this point. We just don't know, right? It really, that is the unknown. Like, and that's the amazing thing about returning to a body of water, especially yes, a body of water sir. like that or the St. John's water River water. where we kick off the season. It's amazing to look at a body of water and see how it's the same lake, it's the same body of water, but it fishes totally different depending on the conditions. But as you know, and as we've learned year after year, the Elite Series pros know how to adapt and don't listen to anything they say. They are gonna smash them in Waddington. Well, that'll be stop number eight, the mighty St. Lawrence River, number eight for the season of nine events on the 2019 Bassmaster Elite Series. And to wrap it up, we're gonna stay in the Empire State. You wouldn't wanna be the lake that comes after the St. Lawrence, but the place we're gonna wrap it up has its own special appeal and charm. Who wouldn't want to be in the Finger Lakes at the end of summer? And Lake Hugh is a beautiful spot. It's a beautiful place, a beautiful area. And the neat thing about it, you've got largemouth and smallmouth. We've been there two times in the past. Largemouth were the fish to target the first time we were there in August. Later in the season, the grass had developed and grown up. But when we were there late June, we saw the size and the quality of the smallmouth there at Lake Cayuga. What do you think the picture will be this year? You know what was interesting about the smallmouth the last time we were there was they didn't hold up. And it was really because of the time of year. A lot of those fish were spawning. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna use a term that you use a lot, Davey, and it's this is gonna be a pick your poison tournament. Uh, when you get into the the month of August in New York, you can rail them shallow. When I mean shallow, biggins on this lake get very very shallow. The other thing that we've not seen transpire on this lake ever 
is where they're really grouped up offshore. Hackney one offshore, but I'm, I'm talking 15 to 25 feet. I think you might see some of that this time around. And somebody that has done well on this body of water, I know is looking forward to it, that's equally as powerful up thin or out deep. Watch Seth Fighter in this tournament. The reason why, you have fished in Minnesota. Yeah. This lake sets up just like a Minnesota lake yeah. where you've got different varieties of grass. Seth Fighter is gonna be a powerhouse in this tournament. And that grass is growing all summer, so you get there in August, man, it's at its peak at that time. Looking forward to all our spots too in New York. We've, we've got also Texas, we've got Oklahoma, we've got South Carolina, Georgia, Lake Lanier for, for the first time for the Elite Series. And we started out Palatka, Florida, the St. John's River. I'll see you guys there and we'll see you there.